One of my favorite go-to products for really small pieces of scrap wood has always been wooden candle holders. They're relatively easy to make and you can use small pieces of wood that would otherwise end up in the trash can. I have a box here filled with a bunch of blanks that uh, some of these are probably 15 or 20 years old, some of them are newer, but uh, I don't turn a lot of candle holders lately so I'm really just, uh, I keep adding to this pile and not doing anything with it. So, a couple days ago I was gluing together some more blanks and um, Oh, look at that. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Oh! Uh, pretty piece of hickory, though. So I was putting together these, uh, uh, cutting up these blocks for um, for making some more candle holder blanks that I'm probably not, not going to do anything with anytime soon. And um, got to thinking, looking at this one, you know, I could probably just glue these blocks together. And uh, instead of using the small blocks for uh, small projects, I could use the small blocks for a big project, like an end grain cutting board. So uh, it's going to be a little bit more work, but uh, I started cutting up a bunch of uh, different colors. I have a pretty good variety here. Uh, lots of different colors, species of wood, and um, I tried to arrange them in somewhat of a random pattern so there wasn't a lot of repeat from uh, one, one uh, row to the next. So I'm just going to have to glue these together and then uh, do all the, the fun planing and sanding work. Anyway, uh, I guess I'll uh, just walk you through the process uh, so you can start going into your scrap bucket and uh, getting prepped to make your end grain cutting board. Alright, as you can see, I already got one of these done. Uh, I recorded the first one and then found out that my camera wasn't recording, so I'm going to try this again with the camera recording, hopefully. So, I think I figured out a pretty good process for doing this, about as good as it can get for uh, gluing these many pieces of wood into a, an end grain cutting board. Uh, so I, I, uh, I'm using these two pieces of scrap wood that uh, have mating edges, nice and straight, and I'm going to glue these pieces up individually as quickly as possible so the glue on one end doesn't dry out before I get to the other, and then I'll put these on there, clamp them that way lightly just to hold everything aligned, and then clamp this way, which is really the important direction. The easiest way to get the glue on there is with uh, a roller and it's just a glue roller and then I, I put some of the glue on a piece of melamine because it won't stick to the melamine it's easy to clean off and then I roll it out and that'll give me a nice large applicator so I can do a bunch of pieces at once before I have to reapply glue that looks just about right there so I'm going to start at this end and the first one I'll put glue on one side just like that gives me a nice even coating. And I'm double siding these because I want to make sure that there's plenty of glue on there. I don't want to have any gaps. So the next one I, I double side it so I got it on both sides and then I just keep going down the line just like that. And I'm taking a look at each one of these just to make sure that I do have reasonably even coverage. If not then I would add a little bit more. But as long as there are no major voids when I clamp everything together the, uh, the glue should spread out and give me good coverage. So far these all look really uh, really even. Right, there we go. I'm going to put these little spacer blocks on here just to elevate this thing slightly. Just uh, gets it more aligned with the center for clamping. And the second one. There we go. Now I'll throw a few clamps on here just to uh, and again, this is not really to, uh, I'm not clamping anything here. All I'm doing is holding it together uh, so that the, the pieces don't shift when I start to put pressure on the uh, length. Laying them down sideways because I need the room. And I'll put one in the middle. Yeah, that way. That should give me enough room. I don't want to clamp too much this way because I need these to to move lengthwise. Where's my clamp? All right, now uh, I just try to get this thing as close to centered as possible because I want it to apply even pressure. Even though I'm clamping in from the sides, it could still move up or down. So uh, having this clamp aligned in the center is pretty important. And then I just give it enough pressure to see the glue start to squeeze out. Make sure that nothing is moving too much. If it is, then I just push it back into place while I still can. Have about 30 seconds of time before uh, 
before it starts to become tacky and the wood doesn't want to move around anymore. And once, once that happens, uh, that's actually a good thing because that means that I can pull the clamps off the side and get these guide boards off of there before everything completely sticks. I just want to make sure that it's all sitting flat on, uh, on this piece of MDF I have as the base. It actually feels pretty even. Uh, you can see that this one turned out pretty well. Good glue squeeze out, just enough, not too much. This seems to be a very good method of, uh, of applying the small blocks like this. A little bit of unevenness, that's going to come out later in the, in the jointer or to do it with a hand plane. So that's it. The second, uh, second one's glued up and I'm going to have to leave the side clamps on for <coughs> probably five minutes or so. <clears throat> just uh, just until everything this way isn't sliding around anymore. And while I'm waiting for that, I can start cleaning up my, uh, my glue off my MDF. A little bit of wasted glue there, but that's okay. I'd rather waste a little bit of glue than a, a lot of scrap wood. All right, now that's reset and ready for the next one. All right, well, that is the last one. So uh, these should be pretty well dry, but I think I'm probably going to give these a couple days before I do anything with them just because a lot of glue on there. And uh, what might happen just from the moisture of the glue um, entering into the wood could cause a little bit of, of warpage. So I want to wait until everything is completely dry. So just a day or two should be fine. That way I know everything's cured. And then I can come along uh, with the jointer and clean up the edges so I can glue all of these together. All right, so now that everything's had a couple days to dry, I'm just gonna run these through the jointer to clean up that edge. Uh, I'm not doing the end grain on this pass. I'm doing the edge grain so that I can glue everything together again. And I'm gonna go really slowly so that I don't, uh, don't uh, tear out a lot of wood. And I'm also gonna use a stop block as I push it through again so that I don't uh, tear out wood on the backside. I marked these before doing this so I could remember how to get them uh, back in the right order. And that looks about right. So it looks like I have four, four nice tight joints there. That should glue up very nicely. And then, uh, of course, I'll have to clean up the top later, but this will just get me through the next step. All right, so it's back to the old gluing board. I uh, just uh, need to put glue on all of the mating edges, clamp it up, and then let it sit for another day or so. Alright, so while the glue is drying, I'm going to start to cut a border to go around the outside of this thing. Uh, even though it's really cool with the, the random wood on the inside, I think it'll look a little bit nicer with a consistent color wrapped around the outside. So uh, for an unnecessary touch of elegance, I decided that I'm going to use this piece of highly figured bird's eye maple. And I have not seen many pieces of bird's eye maple with that much figure, so this is just a really cool piece of wood. And in case you're wondering, why? Why would you put unnecessary elegance in a cutting board? 
it's because there's no other kind of elegance. So I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I'm going to have fun with it. Since I'm working on this thing little by little, you know, just 15 and 20 minutes here or there in the evenings, um, I'm not in a big rush, so I, I decided to glue these pieces together first, and then I can attach them on there as, <clears throat> as one single piece of wood instead of trying to clamp everything up and align it all at the same time. One thing I wanted to point out, though, right, these are three pieces that were cut from the same board, so everything should look pretty consistent, but... Um, the grain direction is pretty important for something like this. So first of all, I'm making sure that the growth rings are going the same way. I and mean, they could alternate. That would be fine, too. Um, you know, just as long as it's a consistent pattern, not two this way, and then the other one going the opposite direction. Uh, but the other thing is, the, uh, especially with figured wood like this, notice what happens if I flip one of these over. Right? The same piece of wood, same figure, and now when it's upside down, now this looks inconsistent and it's going to be even more noticeable when I put the oil finish on there. So I'm being very careful to line everything up first and make sure that it doesn't look as much like three separate pieces of wood. I want this to kind of look more, more like one uh, single piece of wood. So I'm going to glue these up and put the front and the back on there. Then I'll trim the edges because the uh, edges still haven't been cleaned up so they're a little bit uneven and have some glue on them. Uh, so glue these on, trim the edges, then I can glue on the sides and uh, then trim it again. And now it's time to trim off the edges. Okay, so I have everything glued together, and I ran it through the table saw to clean up the edges, and while I was at it, I decided to remove about an eighth of an inch of thickness from all the border sides, uh, just because I think it looks a little bit better with the border slightly narrower. Um, so now I have to run it through the thickness planer to flatten top and bottom. Before I do that, uh, from a hard lesson learned, I'm going to round over all the edges so it's a little bit easier when the, wood enter, or when the uh, knives enter and exit the wood. If I don't round the edges, it's going to be a lot of pressure on the end grain here, and it will likely just chip off large chunks of wood. And I've already destroyed one cutting board and one planer doing that, so I'm going to try not to do that again.
because this is a slightly thicker board, I'm going to make it a little bit more comfortable to pick up by putting a couple grooves down the side. And um, I don't like using those rubber feet on the bottom. I don't know why. I just haven't gotten used to it. I like it. That way you can flip the board over and it's still the same on either side because it's an end grain board. So um, I'm using this bowl bottom bit here and I already have some stop locks set up. All I'm going to do is start with a very shallow cut and uh, drop the board down, move it over, take it out, and raise the bit until I get to the correct depth. Sanded everything down to 320 grit, made sure there were no, uh, no scratches and uh, the grain looked pretty even throughout. And the reason I blew it out with the air compressor is because there are a lot of different colors of wood here and I don't want some orange paduke dust getting mixed up with the oil and causing kind of a slurry, a, a dark mix inside the ash and discoloring some of these other pieces. So uh, when you're doing a, a board like this, the air compressor is a good idea. Uh, it's a good idea in general just to remove the dust before finishing. So I'm going to use my uh, good old trusted can of water locks for this. It's my favorite finish for cutting boards because it, uh, it's a drying oil. And uh, something important with this board, you'll notice that there are a lot of different grain patterns. The grain runs in different directions on a lot of these pieces and there are also several different densities of wood. And what's going to happen when this thing gets wet is this piece is going to want to expand that way, this piece will want to expand that way, and so on and so forth, and it can actually cause an ice board like this to crack. So uh, I use a penetrating oil finish that's going to harden inside the wood, so that will stabilize the wood fibers, whereas if I were to use uh, like mineral oil or something, eventually, no matter how deeply it's soaked in, that mineral oil would get washed out, and then the wood would start to expand and contract in all different directions and cause this board to crack. I definitely don't want that to happen. And uh, as long as I have the cutting board or the uh, can of mineral uh, water locks one more time open. Uh, I went on a cutting board spree this weekend and put a couple other ones together so I'm just going to finish everything at once. And I'm even putting a coat of finish on my ET cutting board which I'm really excited for. I still have to come back later and uh, and fill in some of the cracks but I want to get the oil on there first just so that the uh, whatever filler I decide to use doesn't uh, discolor any of the areas around the cracks. So I'm, I'm going to make sure that I put a sealer coat on it first, penetrate the wood, and then I'll figure out what I can do with those cracks and put a, a finish coat of oil on there later. So this is the uh, most rewarding part of the job after the pain of sanding is over. We get to see what this thing is going to look like in the end.
These cutting boards don't have to be complicated. This one just made out of a small piece of ambrosia maple. Look how fast that's soaking up that oil. This is definitely going to use a lot to seal this thing up. You know, I'm just see it soaking in there. And I'm going to leave the top of this soaking wet because I want it to soak in as deeply as it possibly can. I want to keep going until it won't soak up anymore. So I know that the fibers all the way in the center of this board have absorbed oil so that when it gets put in water, the oil is already occupying the space and the fibers that the water would otherwise occupy because oil will not make the wood swell. One thing I should probably point out as I'm doing this is that water locks is non-toxic when it's completely uh, dry and cured, meaning the solvent has evaporated. So these things are going to stink like solvent uh, for probably at least a month, considering how deep uh, the oil is going to penetrate. So the test for when this is ready to use is just to smell it. If it doesn't smell like solvent anymore, then it's ready to use. So you just want to find somewhere uh, where you can set this up on, you know, some blocks like these ones, uh, just to allow the air to circulate. And once that smell is gone, it's ready. And speaking of Dane Bramage, if you're going to do this with a solvent-based finish, make sure that you either have a respirator or an open door so you get plenty of ventilation. This is not the kind of stuff that you want to breathe for long periods of time. I'm using the open door approach. Ideally, I would have a respirator and an open door, but for whatever reason, I just have not gotten around to buying one yet. Uh, I just got a dust collection system last year, so I'm, you know, stepping up my, my uh, lung safety. But uh, it's something to keep in mind. Make open doors an absolute minimum. If you don't have any kind of uh, clean air coming into your shop while you're doing this, you're going to get a little bit dizzy and probably cause yourself some damage. Yeah, I probably need to get a respirator. At this point, I've gone over all of these probably at least seven or eight times. And uh, they're starting to absorb less oil, so I'm getting close to the point where I think I can stop. Uh, once it doesn't absorb any more oil, it's good enough. And one coat is, from my experience, sufficient. As long as it's soaked in deep enough, it's going to stabilize those wood fibers and keep the wood looking great for a long time. The other advantage of only doing one coat is that if you put on more than one, you're going to start to build up a gloss on the surface. And you don't really want that. You want to have a, a nice, uh, lively wood color like that, but without all the gloss. At this point, I've probably gone over each one of these about ten times, and they're really not absorbing much more oil. And that's the, the point that I wanted to get to. So I'm going to give it one more and let it soak in for a while, and then come back and wipe everything off. I've already done the first pass to wipe off the excess oil. One important thing I want to point out is that after you uh, put this much oil into a wooden project, even after you wipe off the, the oil that's on the surface, it's going to continue to squeeze it out through the pores for maybe an hour or two until it really sets up on the inside. So you want to be careful to keep working at it and um, periodically checking. I mean, you're committed for an hour or two now uh, until all of those little spots stop pushing through because if you don't catch them now, they're going to dry like that, and you're going to have shiny spots on your board that are going to be tricky to get rid of. So uh, keep che checking on it. Uh, come out to the garage once in a while. Rub off any shiny spots. If you can't get rid of them, you can put a few drops of mineral spirits on a rag, and that should help. But uh, just good aggressive scrubbing with a clean rag should also do the trick. Well, I've been buffing this thing on and off for the past hour or two, and I don't see any new squeeze out. So I think it's about time to call this project complete. I even brought out a couple of boards that I did a few weeks ago just to illustrate that if you want to make cutting boards you can do it with just about anything. You can use wide pieces, short pieces, narrow pieces, long pieces, figured pieces, extraterrestrial pieces, whatever you got is probably going to be okay. All you need to get started are a couple small pieces of scrap and you probably got some of this lying around. 
So if you can think of anybody in your life who might benefit from some unnecessary elegance, now's a good opportunity to put a smile on their face. So go out to your shop, pick through your boxes and buckets, see what you got, make some cool stuff, have some fun with it, and thanks for watching.